welcome to our episode uh, on um, uh, uh, semi-colonialism and international law. Today we have the pleasure of having Dr. David Kianusai, um, uh, uh, who will be speaking on uh, Hawaiian Kingdom and international law. By way of introduction, Dr. Sai holds a PhD in political science, specializing in uh, Hawaiian constitutionalism and international relations. And he's a founding member of the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics. Uh, Dr. Sai served as lead agent for the Hawaiian Kingdom in arbitration proceedings before the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague, Netherlands. <clears throat> he also served as an agent in a complaint against the United States of America concerning the prolonged occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom, which was filed with the United Nations Security Council in 2001. Um, Dr. Sai has written articles on the status of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state, which have been published in some of the most prestigious journals of international law, such as the American Journal of International Law, the Chinese Journal of International Law. Uh, most recently, uh, he, uh, uh, he uh, published a piece uh, in Hawaiian Journal of Law and Politics, which deals with uh, indigeneity and Hawaiian Kingdom. We're very pleased to have you, Dr. Sai, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, let's see. Well, uh, let me go ahead. Since we're on a timeline, I'll go ahead and share screen. Aloha. Uh, as we say in uh, in Hawaii, uh, aloha kakahiaka. It's quite early in the morning here. Um, I want to extend my, my gratitude to La Jindal, Center for International Legal Studies for this invitation. Um, so why don't we begin? Uh, my presentation will be on the Hawaiian Kingdom, United States, and international law. What a lot of people don't realize is that the Hawaiian Kingdom was a recognized state since 1843. By virtue of the Anglo-French proclamation, both Great Britain and France recognized the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state. Prior to this date, Hawaii was considered a British protectorate since 1794 in an agreement entered into between King Kamehameha I and Captain Vancouver on behalf of King George III. This was followed by recognition explicitly by the United States on July 6, 1844 from Secretary of State John C. Calhoun on behalf of President John Tyler. Here the president in this letter explicitly recognized the independence of the Hawaiian government. Since then, Great Britain entered into a treaty with the Hawaiian Kingdom, and the Hawaiian Kingdom had a legation in, in the city of London and consulates in these cities. France then entered into a treaty with the Hawaiian Kingdom, where the Hawaiian Kingdom had a legation or embassy in Paris, and these are the Hawaiian consulates in cities throughout France and the United States in 1849 entered into a treaty with the Hawaiian Kingdom and the Hawaiian Kingdom had a legation in the city of Washington DC and Hawaiian consulates in those cities. Other contracting states that entered into treaties with the Hawaiian Kingdom included Austria-Hungary, Belgium, Denmark, Germany, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Portugal, Russia, Spain, Switzerland, and the United Sweden and Norway. And Hawaii by 1893 had over 90 legations or embassies throughout the whole world. A common misunderstanding is that Hawaii had unequal treaties with these European powers and also uh, powers of the Americas. Uh, in fact, Hawaii had no unequal treaty, uh, like let's say Japan uh, or Siam, where these powers would impose their own laws within these foreign territories over their citizenry. Uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom actually uh, was able to apply its laws in Japan by virtue of the uh, treaty it had, where if any Hawaiian subject would get into trouble in Japan, let's say in 1880, 
that person could only be uh, held accountable or, or prosecuted uh, or subject to a, a trial by the Hawaiian consulate called consular jurisdiction in Tokyo. The Hawaiian kingdom was one of only three non-European powers in the family of nations throughout the 19th century. The Hawaiian kingdom was a recognized neutral state by treaty along with Belgium, Luxembourg, and Switzerland. As a constitutional monarchy, the Hawaiian kingdom's literacy was second to Scotland, and it became the first welfare state that predates the Nordic states by a century. And Aboriginal Hawaiians in this welfare state system uh, throughout the Hawaiian Islands received universal health care at no charge. Between 1880 and 1892, 18 Hawaiian subjects participated in the Hawaiian Youth Abroad Program, where they studied in England, Scotland, Italy, United States, China, and Japan. In England, they attended King's College and St. Chad's College. Subjects included military training, ironworks, medicine, engraving, politics, law, and sculpture. The founder of modern China, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, attended Iolani College and Punahou School in Honolulu from 1879 to 1883. When he was in Hawaii in 1910, Dr. Sun told a reporter in Hawaii that this is my Hawaii. Here I was brought up and educated, and it was here that I came to know what modern civilized governments are like and what they mean. Well, now we get to the unpleasant part of Hawaii's history, the United States invasion of the Hawaiian kingdom and the overthrow of the Hawaiian government. Judge Greenwood states that traditional international law was based upon a rigid distinction between the state of peace and the state of war. Countries were either in a state of peace or a state of war. There was no intermediate state. Acts of war triggers a state of war. And a state of war includes belligerent occupation. By direction of Hawaii's Queen Lili Ukulani, President Cleveland in March of 1893 initiated the investigation of the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government on January 17, 1893. On December 18, 1893, 11 months later, the president reported to the Congress his findings and conclusions of his investigation. He stated to the Congress on the 16th day of January, 1893, between four and five o'clock in the afternoon, a detachment of Marines from the United States steamer Boston with two pieces of artillery landed at Honolulu. The men, upwards of 160 in all, were supplied with double cartridge belts filled with ammunition and with haversacks and canteens and were accompanied by a hospital corps with stretchers and medical supplies. This military demonstration, he concluded, upon the soil of Honolulu was of itself an act of war. This act of war is what triggered a state of war. They concluded by an act of war with the participation of a diplomatic representative of the United States and without authority of Congress, the government of a feeble but friendly and confiding people has been overthrown. The provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States. These acts of war committed by the United States triggered a state of war with the Hawaiian Kingdom. Now, under international law, the military overthrow of a country's government does not equate to an overthrow of the state or the country. According to Brownlee, after the defeat of Nazi Germany in the Second World War, the four major allied powers assumed supreme power in Germany. The legal competence of the German state, its independence and sovereignty did not, however, disappear. What occurred is akin to a legal representation or agency of necessity. The German state continued to exist and indeed the legal basis of the occupation depended on its existence. So in international relations and law, the distinction between what is called state sovereignty, which is the country, and the government that exercises that authority. It is possible to overthrow a government but that doesn't mean you overthrew the country. State sovereignty and its independence still remain, but it is obliged upon the occupying state to serve in that temporary capacity or, is that, or that agent to temporarily administer the laws of the occupied state until there's a treaty of peace. 
Now, customary international law in 1893 obligated the United States as the occupying state to administer the laws of the Hawaiian kingdom and not the laws of the United States when they are in effective control of territory. This obligation is now codified under Article 43 of the 1907 Hague Regulations and Article 64 of the 1949 Fourth Geneva Convention. The U.S. did not administer Hawaiian kingdom law and unilaterally annexed the Hawaiian Islands in 1898. The driving force for what the United States had done to Hawaii had in as its objective to secure Hawaii as a military outpost to make use of Pearl Harbor as a naval station. That was the back, background behind why the United States did what it did. So how does a state acquire the territory of another state under international law? Well, according to Oppenheim, cession of state territories, the transfer of sovereignty over state territory by the owner state to another state. And the only form in which a cession can be effected is an agreement embodied in a treaty between the ceding and the acquiring state. So here we have two sovereign entities, two sovereign and independent states represented by their governments. One government will cede its territory to another government. And that could be voluntary through negotiation. And this would occur during a peace. Or it could be involuntary as a result of a state of war. But treaties apply in this case, more particularly the United States and the American states in the 19th century did not carry on that principle or apply that principle of devalatio, which is conquest. So the United States only acquired territory through treaties, not through subjugation and conquest, as you would otherwise do during a time of what would be called devalatio. So here we have a map of the United States of America, massive territory. But when the United States achieved its independence from Great Britain, right, that's only the east coast of the Americas. The United States acquired lands west of the Mississippi and south of Georgia by foreign states. The first cession of territory to have occurred between the United States was with France, and that is what we call the Louisiana Purchase, all French territory west of the Mississippi River. Prior to 1803, French law applied over that territory after 1803, American law. This was then followed in 1819 in a treaty with the Spanish, and then Pacific Northwest, 1846. You have Alaska in 1867. These are considered uh, cession of territorial ceded lands uh, done during a state of peace. The United States has acquired a large chunk of land that used to be Mexico. And that was under the 1848 Treaty of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo, which where Mexico transferred its territory north of the Rio Grande as a result of a treaty of peace that ended the Mexican-American War. What is the authority of Hawaii's session? How did Hawaii become a part of the United States as an independent state? Well, it was a joint resolution, number 55, to provide for annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States. The problem here is uh, joint resolution is an American law enacted by the United States Congress. It's a municipal law. It is not a treaty. It is not a treaty between the Hawaiian kingdom and the United States. Now from the congressional record, Senator William Allen of Nebraska during a debate on the joint resolution of annexation stated quite clearly that the Constitution and the statutes are territorial in their operation. That is, they cannot have any binding force or operation beyond the territorial limits of the government in which they are promulgated. In other words, the Constitution and statutes cannot reach across the territorial boundaries of the United States into the territorial domain of another government and affect that government or persons or property therein. He's referring to the independence and sovereignty that a state has over its territory. He also stated that the joint resolution is ipso facto no and void. Nevertheless, Congress is going to proceed forward to secure Hawaii as a military outpost, which currently houses 118 United States military sites. Now the United States Supreme Court in 1936 addressed the issue 
of U.S. municipal laws and its limitation. It stated that neither the federal constitution nor the laws passed in pursuance of it have any force in foreign territory. And operations of the United States in such territory must be governed by treaties, international understandings and compacts, and the principles of international law. What people have been looking, using to look at Hawaii's history or to analyze Hawaii's history, they've been using American law, they've been using the American constitution. And this has created much confusion. In fact, they, 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 they tend to say that native Hawaiians or Aboriginal Hawaiians have a similar history to native Americans. That is not true. Uh, it is a very different history. Uh, one, the Hawaiian kingdom you know, is its own country and it has a treaty with the United States recognizing that independence. Recently, since I began to be involved at the academy, at the university, after returning back from the, universe, from the, uh, the Hague in the Netherlands, uh, permanent court of arbitration, I brought in international law. I brought in principles of international law. And that's why it is important that this is the framework that is used to analyze and to understand and to interrogate Hawaii's legal and political history, not the United States Constitution, nor American laws, because they are limited to US territory. Why is it that we don't know this? Denationalization. This individual, Samuel Damon, was an insurgent. He was not an American. He was actually a Hawaiian subject, Caucasian, but an insurgent. He stated in order to maintain control because they are still trying to get to be annexed by the United States on the record, he stated, if we're ever to have peace and annexation, the first thing to do is to obliterate the past. Well, denationalization is an international term, which is to obliterate the national consciousness of the occupied state in the minds of its people. Now, granted, you can't change the minds of adults and you can change the minds of children. In 1919, denationalization was listed as a war crime, titled Attempts to Denationalize the Inhabitants of Occupied Territory. Stemming from Italy's occupation of Yugoslavia in the Second World War, Yugoslav Charge Number 1434 stated, apart from killing, deporting, and interning innocent persons, the Italians started a policy on a vast scale of denationalization. As part of such policy, they started a system of re-education of Yugoslav children. This re-education consisted of forbidding children to use the, so the Serbo-Croat language to sing Yugoslav songs and forcing them to salute in a fascist way. This policy of Americanization was implemented in 1906 and this is a program for patriotic exercises in the public schools, which also included the private schools. And it was published by the government of the territory of Hawaii, which was a proxy of the United States as an occupier. The theme of the program was to indoctrinate the children of the Hawaiian Islands to be American and to speak English. A news reporter from Harper's Weekly Magazine from New York was in Hawaii doing a story on this indoctrination. Here he takes a picture, he took a picture of six, 614 school children. Now this is my grandparents' generation at Kaiolani Public School. Under the heading of this picture, it says, at the command of the principal, they all yell in unison, we give our heads and our hearts to God and our country. One country, one language, one flag. If these children spoke the national language of Hawaiian, uh, they were severely disciplined and in some cases beaten. This scene shows a salute to the American flag which flies in the grounds of the Kaiolani Public School, which has many Japanese pupils. The drill is constantly held as a means of inculcating patriotism in the hearts of the children. That term inculcate is to indoctrinate or brainwash through repetition. As Dresden James, a British novelist, one, once wrote, which is so appropriate to Hawaii's situation, when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the mass, masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. The dam of ignorance begins to break. 
In 1988, the United States Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel questions Hawaii's annexation in a legal opinion for the U.S. State Department. The Office of Legal Counsel concluded it is therefore unclear which constitutional power of Congress exercised when it acquired Hawaii by joint resolution. Accordingly, it is doubtful that the acquisition of Hawaii can serve as an appropriate precedent for a congressional assertion of sovereignty over an extended territorial sea. Now, the effective control of Hawaiian territory by the United States and its proxies since January 17, 1893, did not extinguish the legal status of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state. Judge Crawford states, pending a final settlement of the conflict, belligerent occupation does not affect the continuity of the occupied state. The governmental authorities may be driven into exile or silence and the exercise of the powers of the state thereby affected, but it is settled that the powers themselves continue to exist. This is strictly, he says, not an application of the actual independence rule, which is effective control of territory, but an exception to it, pending settlement of the conflict by a peace treaty or its equivalent. So here for the last hundred years, over a century, all that was overthrown was the Hawaiian government, the Hawaiian state, it, it's sovereign independence remained intact as a subject of international law, but the state had been silent for all these years. In 1997, a council of regency was established to restore that government under what would be called the doctrine of necessity and in strict compliance with the laws that existed prior to the invasion. The council of regency is not a new government through extra legal means, but rather a successor to Queen Lili Ukulani as the executive monarch. Addressing over a century of occupation, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was formed similar to the formation of governments in exile during the Second World War. In particular, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was established in similar fashion to the Belgian Council of Regency after King Leopold was captured by the Nazis. As the Belgian Council of Regency was established under Article 82 of the Belgian Constitution of 1821, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was established under Article 33 of the Hawaiian Constitution of 1864. The Council had established a strategic plan to engage over a century of prolonged occupation. Phase one, verification of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state and subject of international law. In order to get past phase one, we would need an international body, a reputable body to verify and acknowledge the continuity of the Hawaiian kingdom as a state. From there, it moves to phase two, exposure of Hawaiian statehood within the framework of international law and the laws of occupation, as it affects the realm of politics and economics at both the international and domestic levels. Phase two will focus on the truth and accountability. Phase three will be triggered, and that's restoration of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state and a subject of international law. This is not to imply that it will become an independent state, but rather it will be have full control of its country and its laws. And this will only occur when the occupation eventually comes to an end. Phase one will be completed through arbitral proceedings at the permanent Court of Arbitration. There are two primary jurisdictions at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, jurisdiction of the institution and jurisdiction of the arbitration tribunal. Prior to forming the tribunal, the PCA has to have institutional jurisdiction first because it is an intergovernmental organization and the disputes have to be international, not domestic. Article 47 of the 1907 Permanent Court of Arbitration Convention, Pacific Settlement for International Disputes provides for its institutional jurisdiction. Quote, the jurisdiction of the permanent court may within the conditions laid down in the regulation be extended to disputes with non-contracting states. The Hawaiian Kingdom is a non-contracting state and therefore would have access to the jurisdiction of the PCA under Article 47. The PA is currently comprised of 122 contracting states to the 1907 convention. 
those contracting states that have diplomats in the Hague, Netherlands, sit as members of the Permanent Court of Arbitration's Administrative Council. They include all of the contracting states with the Hawaiian Kingdom in its treaties, the United States, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain, Hungary, Italy, Japan, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, Russia, Spain, Sweden, and Switzerland. Under Article 49 of the 1907 Convention, the Administrative Council publishes an annual report on the work of the court, the functioning of its administration services, and on its expenditure. In its annual reports from the year 2000 to 2011, the Administrative Council stated explicitly that the Larson versus Hawaiian Kingdom Arbitral Tribunal was established pursuant to Article 47 of the 1907 Convention. Those contracting states with the Hawaiian Kingdom in its treaties to include the United States are all members of the Administrative Council and co-publishers of the annual reports that acknowledge the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state and consequently the full force and effect of those treaties which were never terminated. In international discourse, intercourse, which includes arbitration, Talmud articulates the relationship between a state and its government. From the fact that states are juridical persons, it follows that they must act through organs. In the words of the Permanent Court of International Justice, states can act only by and through agents, their agents and representatives. It is generally agreed that the organ representing the state in international intercourse is its government. But as Professor Bin Chang has rightly pointed out, states not only act through their governments, but through their governments exclusively. The Administrative Council simultaneously acknowledged and recognized the Council of Regency as the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom. In the American Journal of International Law, which covered this proceedings, it stated that at the center of the proceedings was that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist and that the Council of Regency representing the Hawaiian Kingdom is legally responsible under international law for the protection of Hawaiian subjects, including the claimant. In other words, the Hawaiian Kingdom was legally obligated to protect Larson from the United States unlawful imposition over him of its municipal laws through its political subdivision, the state of Hawaii. As a result of this responsibility, Larson submitted the Hawaiian Council of Regency should be liable for any international law violations that the United States had committed against it. Now, the proceedings of the arbitral tribunal is what would be called subject matter jurisdiction. This is secondary for the Hawaiian Kingdom government, the Council of Regency. What was pivotal in, this, in these proceedings was for the Administrative Council to acknowledge that the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state still exists, okay? That's important because the, tribun the, the, the tribunal could not have been formed without first the Permanent Court of Arbitration accepting the international dispute as the Hawaiian Kingdom being a non-contracting state. The Permanent Court of Arbitration is an intergovernmental organization that creates ad hoc tribunals. The PCA has institutional jurisdiction for the following disputes between two states. Here we have from the case repository of the permanent court, Ecuador versus the United States. And in this case repository, they verify that Ecuador is a state and the United States is a state, thus creating an arbitral and ad hoc arbitral tribunal. The PCA also has institutional jurisdiction for disputes between a state and an international organization. Here we have the District Municipality of La Punta, Peru, versus the United Nations Office for Project Services. Here they identify Peru as a state and the United Nations as an international organization. The PCA has institutional jurisdiction also for disputes between a state and a private party. Here we have Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom, here they identify Lance Paul Larson as a private entity, the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state. It was after this determination by the Administrative Council that in June of 2000, a tribunal was formed 
comprised of Dr. Gavin Griffith, and later to become judges of the International Court of Justice, Professor Greenwood and Professor Crawford. Ms. Ninia Parks represented Lance Larson as counsel and agent, and I served as lead agent for the legal team that represented the Hawaiian Kingdom. The Dominion of the Hawaiian Kingdom. In summary, from 1840, the Hawaiian Kingdom possessed a constitutional government with elected and appointed officials and a complete system of civil and criminal laws to govern Hawaiian territory. On April 8, 1842, King Kamehameha III and Privy Council commissioned three envoys to secure international recognition of Hawaiian independence. And these individuals are Timoteo Ha'alilil, William Richards, and Sir George Simpson. On December 19, 1842, Hawaiian envoys secured the United States President Tyler's recognition of Hawaiian independence. November 28, 1843, the British government and the French government formally enter into a declaration recognizing Hawaiian independence. In our pleadings, we refer to that as the 1843 Anglo-Franco Proclamation. From that point, Hawaii has had its statehood recognized as being independent. As such, it began to enter into these treaties, Austria-Hungary, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Russia, Spain, and the United States of America. International recognition is evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom had diplomatic representatives as of 1893 from those countries, as far as consulates and embassies. Rather, what we find is that the United States has never expressed, it, expressed itself as an occupier. Who would? They will never admit to occupation. But yet, to admit to occupation is, in a sense, to admit to the continued existence of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state, which is really the crux of the matter which is actually what is holding up, you might say, this issue to be resolved. Thus, the legal order. Thus, the reestablishment of the government. Thus, the relationship between its nationals. I, I mean, to be, to be slightly unkind, but thus, the issue in REM. The point is that if the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist, its existence is in REM. It's not in persona, and the Hawaiian existence, the, the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist solely in the opinion of Mr. Larson. Right. But that existence should not be dependent upon an occupier, because you basically put the occupier at an, on an equal footing with the Hawaiian kingdom in its own territory. So really what needs to be addressed is what came before the occupation, whether the statehood or whether the legality or illegality of the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the illegality or legality of the United States as an occupier. Should the tribunal find it has jurisdiction, we are prepared to submit an offer of proof. We felt that this tribunal would offer some clarity so that for the first time we have a third party to present these type of merits and be scrutinized by international law, rather than taking it before a United States tribunal which could not rule on it to the detriment of itself. So in that sense, there is really no other way to address this issue. And the opportunity did arise because it was Mr. Larson who was adhering to Hawaiian Kingdom law. And if the United States was adhering to occupation, not whether they're illegal or illegal, but if they were adhering to the laws of occupation, we wouldn't be here right now. So what you witnessed here was uh, according to our strategic plan, the Administrative Council already verified that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist, so we were able to get past phase one. These proceedings for the Hawaiian government reflected phase two, and this was beginning that exposure phase. Uh, Dr. Bio Zagara was actually uh, attending a hearing at the International Court of Justice on a Friday, and this was on December 8th, and this was Congo versus uh, Belgium addressing an international arrest warrant. And uh, it was there that Dr. Bio Zagara became aware of the proceedings that were happening across the hall 
in the Peace Palace at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. We found out that Dr. Bill Zagara was able to access all records because we made it public. And he was communicating with his government in Kigali uh, when he sent the pleadings and records to his government. Uh, when we were called to that meeting in Brussels by him, uh, at the meeting, he explained this to us. And he said that it was clear that, it, that, that Hawaii was occupied and that this could not be tolerated. And that he said that on behalf of the president through the Minister of Foreign Affairs to himself, he had the authority to basically say to us that Rwanda is offering the Council of Regency the opportunity to report to the United Nations General Assembly, the prolonged occupation of Hawaii to put this matter on the agenda. After a quick meeting I had with my, with my legal team and other members of the Council of Regency, I sat back down in front of the ambassador and I thanked him for his government's uh, uh, offer, but we couldn't in good conscience take it because our people back home had no idea of Hawaii's profound status, except this offer because they needed to address denationalization first. Uh, the meeting then came to a close after salutations were given and we traveled back to The Hague and uh, we were preparing to uh, embark back home. Well, according to the law of land warfare, U.S. Army Field Manual 27-10, which covers the law of occupation. And I'm very familiar with this field manual as I used to be a captain in the Army as a field artillery officer. It says here for the remedies for violation of international law, which are war crimes. In the event of violation of the law of war, the injured party may legally resort to remedial action of the following types. What we will focus on is this. Publication of the fact with the view to influencing public opinion against the offending belligerent. This is how we are going to be addressing head on denationalization, which will be through academic research. In line with the strategic plan, the council agreed that I as chairman and minister of the interior would enter the University of Hawaii at Manoa political science department in order to directly engage American denationalization. I received my master's degree specializing in international relations in 2004. And then I received later in 2008, my PhD degree with a direct focus on the continuity of the Hawaiian kingdom and providing a solution to the illegal occupation. First order of business was education in order to counter over a century of Americanization. And this prompted a plethora of publications at the academy that is, dealing, that, have, that is dealing with the prolonged occupation of the Hawaiian kingdom, but at the center of all these publications is the continuity of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state. Coursework at the University of Hawaii uh, teaches uh, matters of international law, international politics. And I'm very glad by the very mere fact that I'm not the only person teaching this. There are many not just at the University of Hawaii, but also throughout the world. The latest publication, Lawrence Guncher, A Power in the World, The Hawaiian Kingdom in Oceania. This education also prompted the United Nations independent expert, Dr. Alfred Desaius, to send a letter of communication to members of the state of Hawaii judiciary. He stated, I have come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation state in continuity, but a nation state that is under a strange form of occupation by the United States resulting from an illegal military occupation and a fraudulent annexation. As such, international laws, the Hague and Geneva Conventions, require that governance and legal matters within the occupied territory of the Hawaiian Islands must be administered by the application of the laws of the occupied state in this case, the Hawaiian Kingdom, and not the domestic laws of the occupier, the United States. Happening today, Hawaii County Council member, Jen Ruggle. War crimes. Last month, Ruggles refused to vote after receiving a copy of a memo from a United Nations independent expert calling Hawaii a sovereign nation state 
under occupation by the United States. Ruggles has asked the county council for clarification on criminal liability under U.S. and international law. The meeting starts at 6 p.m. at the Ka'al Community Center. So the issue of Hawaii as an independent state, and in particular war crimes that haven't continued to be committed, has now begun to reach the public. Now there is no requirement for a legal evaluation by the perpetrator of a war crime as to the existence of an armed conflict that led to a belligerent occupation. In that context, there is no requirement for awareness by the perpetrator of the facts that establish the character of the armed conflict that led to a belligerent occupation. There is only a requirement for the awareness of the factual circumstances that establish the existence of the armed conflict that led to a belligerent occupation. This is the double edge of education and exposure. It addresses that main element of mens rea, the guilty mind. Also under the remedies for violations of international law and war crimes is that the request of a party to the conflict and inquiry shall be instituted in a manner to be decided between the interested parties concerning any alleged violation of the Geneva Convention. This resulted in the Council of the Regency establishing by proclamation, the Royal Commission of Inquiry on April 17, 2019. The purpose of the Royal Commission shall be to investigate the consequences of the United States belligerent occupation, including with regard to international law, humanitarian law and human rights, and the allegations of war crimes committed in that context. Article three of the proclamation provides that the composition of the Royal Commission shall be decided by the head and shall be comprised of recognized experts in various fields. The Royal Commission of Inquiry has acquired legal opinions from the following experts in international law. Professor Matthew Craven, University of London, SOAS School of Law on the subject of the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state under international law. Professor William Shabas, Middlesex University London School of Law, on the subject of the elements of war crimes committed in the Hawaiian Kingdom. And Professor Federico Lenzarini, University of Siena, Italy, Department of Political and International Studies on the subject of human rights violations in the Hawaiian Kingdom and the right of self-determination. War crimes that are currently being committed include denationalization, pillaging, unlawful appropriation of property, depriving a protected person of a fair and regular trial, destruction of property, unlawful confinement of a protected person, removing protected persons from the country, and involuntary conscription into the U.S. Armed Forces. There is no statute of limitation for those who committed war crimes, and a person can be prosecuted more than 50 years after the war crime was committed. States and the International Criminal Court are obligated to prosecute individuals who have committed war crimes irrespective of their nationality or the territory where the war crime was committed. The Royal Commission of Inquiry provides its reports to the Council of Regency, contracting states of the Hague and Geneva Conventions, the International Criminal Court, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the National Lawyers Guild. The first task of the commission was to publish an ebook on the formation of the Royal Commission of Inquiry and on subjects relating to the Hawaiian Kingdom and its prolonged occupation by the United States. A uh, recent publication of the commission was back in January of 2020, investigating war crimes and human rights violations committed in the Hawaiian Kingdom. I was the author of the first three sections, the Royal Commission of Inquiry, chapter one, Hawaiian Constitutional Governance, chapter two, United States Belligerent Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom, Chapter three was authored by Professor Matthew Craven, Continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a State under International Law. Chapter four was authored by Professor William Shabas, War Crimes Related to the United States Belligerent Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And chapter five, Professor Federico Lanzarini was the author, International Human Rights Law and Self-Determination of Peoples Related to the United States Occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Uh, this book is free and it's an ebook. The Royal Commission of Inquiry will officially begin will pro with providing preliminary reports on certain subjects in order to bring awareness as to the scope of its investigative authority and the methods of its investigation. The first preliminary report of the commission addressed the material elements of war crimes and ascertaining the mens rea. Second preliminary report 
covered the authority of the Council of Regency of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Its third preliminary report was legal status of land titles throughout the islands, which explains why all land titles in the Hawaiian Islands are defective as a result of what occurred in 1893. Also, a supplemental report was put out by the commission to show what title insurance is as a remedy for the defects in title, but also well, many people we found don't know what title insurance is. It's very important to know what that is because there is a, a way to protect yourself by the mere fact of the pandemic that people are not able to make their monthly payments anymore. They have title insurance that, that covers that. And the, final re the latest preliminary report addressed the explicit recognition of the Hawaiian state and of the Council of Regency as its government by the United States of America. Uh, the Royal Commission of Inquiry can be accessed at its website at hawaiiankingdom.org. The National Lawyers Guild sent a letter on November 10, 2020 to Governor Ige. States here that the National Lawyers Guild, the oldest and largest progressive bar association in the United States, with 70 chapters and more than 6,000 members, calls upon the state of Hawaii and its county governments as the proxy of the United States, which is in effective control of Hawaiian territory, to immediately comply with international humanitarian law while the United States continues its prolonged and illegal occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom since 1893. In closing, the National Lawyers Guild wrote, we urge you, Governor Ige, to proclaim the transformation of the state of Hawaii and its counties into an occupying government pursuant to the Council of Regency's proclamation of June 3rd, 2019, in order to administer the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom. This would include carrying into effect the Council of Regency's proclamation of October 10th, 2014, that brings the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom in the 19th century up to date. We further urge you and other officials of the state of Hawaii and its counties to familiarize yourselves with the contents of the recent ebook published by the Royal Commission of Inquiry and its reports that comprehensively explains the current situation of the Hawaiian Islands and the impact that international humanitarian law and human rights law have on the state of Hawaii and its inhabitants. Now, the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, who holds a consultative status with the United Nations, took a position by a resolution passed in February of 2021, calling upon the United States to immediately comply with international humanitarian law in its prolonged occupation of the Hawaiian Islands, the Hawaiian Kingdom. The IEDL fully supports the National Lawyers Guild's letter of November 10, 2020, to State of Hawaii Governor David Ige, urging him to proclaim the transformation of the State of Hawaii and its counties into an occupying government. So what we have is, I wanted to share with everyone here, Hawaii's very unique and profound legal and political history and its profound consequences and effects today. And with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, uh, Prakapa Kar. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sai, for this wonderful presentation. As a student of international law, I can only say that your presentation um, was right there uh, as a perfect text, a, a perfect um, set of arguments for teaching uh, state recognition with its history as well as doctrine. I've never had uh, such a class that uh, mixes the history and the doctrine so well. What I admired the most about your presentation, besides the courage of facing the racists that uh, do not have arguments, is that you've placed your case for the freedom or the recognition of Hawaiian kingdom as a proper subject of international law right within the doctrine. Something that critical lawyers sometimes, not if always, sometimes they fail to sort of uh, use uh, the vocabulary, the standard vocabulary of uh, the law to make a very critical case. Uh, and that, that was very admirable. Um, uh, from now on, uh, I would like to invite you as often as uh, possible in the classes on international law where I teach state recognition. And I hope you'll have the time uh, to come to uh, my classes and teach me and our students here. It was a fabulous presentation. Um, and uh, the clarity uh, uh, with which you presented was just wonderful. Uh, and I'm saying this as a student, as an admirer of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of your work, which you just presented. And uh, I also uh, 
acknowledge the fact that this builds upon almost 20, 30 years of constant work uh, with the government and also in The Hague. Um, so, so really, we are very, very fortunate to have you today uh, uh, presenting, us, uh, uh, presenting to us uh, the history and law of the uh, Hawaiian Kingdom. While you were making the presentation, I was trying to think of parallels. Um, and perhaps there are not many parallels, uh, as you say, because uh, different occupations around the world have different legal and political histories. Uh, what is important to note as an Indian lawyer is that in the 60s, when uh, the International Court of Justice gave uh, its opinion, uh, gave its judgment uh, in a case that Portugal had brought against India in relation to Goa, in relation to uh, you know territories that Portugal still had colonized and it had to cross through India to govern it. Um, uh, the International Court of Justice ruled that Portugal only had a civil right of passage, not a military right of passage. And soon after India sent forces in Goa to assimilate Goa and the terminology that Indian government used was to liberate Goa from colonialism. And of course, you know, so the, so, uh, and, and, and when the matter reached the Indian Supreme Court, but then uh, Chief Justice, uh, Justice Hidayatullah, who was himself a Cambridge educated international lawyer, um, in fact, a direct student of uh, Lord McNair and Lotter Pact, uh, used the Hawaiian occupation uh, to justify. One of the examples that uh, Hidayatullah, the Chief Justice um, at the Indian Supreme Court, uses uh, to justify India's occupation of Goa, annexation and occupation of Goa, is that of Hawaiian Kingdom. Very interesting. And uh, this came to me um, once I sort of sat through your presentation and I was thinking how post-colonial states such as India have been making use of such examples to sort of further uh, make legitimate claims. The claims now, as you, uh, as you very clearly approve, were itself not very legitimate when it is sort of in relation to the US and Hawaiian Kingdom. Uh, so we are very, very, very uh, we are thankful for your uh, enriching presentation and we would like to have questions from our audience if there are any. Thank you. Okay, so there's a question from Michael, uh, Michael Strauss. Uh, does the US argument that Russia's annexation of Crimea violates international law have any potential for Hawaii's argument given the broadly parallel sequences of events from the annexing state's military presence through a lease agreement um, to the occupation and then the annexation? Well, the one thing that makes Hawaii unique, our situation is the permanent court of arbitration and the administrative proceedings. So with the United States being a member of the Administrative Council, uh, the Administrative Council collectively publishes the annual reports. In there, they specifically stated that the Hawaiian Kingdom met the jurisdictional requirement as a non-contracting state. So that basically acknowledges the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom and that the United States, if they would have brought up any counter argument, Right. They would have done a declaration by notice with the Dutch foreign ministry. In fact, that situation occurred in 2015 when Palestine acceded to the 1907 PCA convention seeking to become a contracting state. Right. As opposed to a non-contracting state. And when they submitted their uh, session, a session to the convention in 2015, the United States submitted a notice, a notice with the Dutch foreign ministry, that it does not consider Palestine by definition to be an independent state and that it doesn't recognize it. So although the administrative council overruled by vote to bring, to accept Palestine as a contracting state, the United States had to take that position, right? And that's a political position. That's not a legal position because I don't agree with the fact that they say Palestine is not a state. Oh, it is. <laughs> it's just a non-member of the UN. Now, they could have done that in the Hawaii situation, but they couldn't because also what international law brings in as a principle is that once a state recognizes the validity of a state, right, they are precluded from denying that existence at any time in the future. And thus you have the separation between the government and the state. So although the United States admitted to the overthrow illegally through intervention of the Hawaiian government, the Hawaiian state was still a subject of international law, absent a treaty. There is no treaty. So the United States was not in that same position that it played that 
political game against Palestine, which eventually it didn't matter because Palestine became a contracting state. So any question as to whether the United States could argue they did it, but the mere fact that the administrative council made the record accepting the Hawaiian kingdom as a non-contracting state negates all arguments that the United States may not claim. And we're still right back to what international law is, basically preserving the sovereignty and independence of states even during occupations. Thank you for your answer. Um, I, I had one more question. Um, well, um, when we look at uh, the, so the history of recognition of states, uh, you know, one of the most foundational textbooks is that of um, uh, Oppenheim, published in 1904, 1905, where he made a list of states that are either sovereign, uh, so full sovereign, and Japan was included because by 1905, that is the year Japan defeats Russia. Um, uh, but a uh, number of states uh, were listed uh, that were not seen as full sovereigns. Uh, and Oppenheim said that the, their sovereignty is actually doubtful uh, simply because they're not in a position to defend itself. And those states were Korea, Siam, Persia, uh, and um, uh, Abyssinia, now Ethiopia. So, uh, so, so when we look at the, the, the interwar period, First World War and Second World War period, Japan was trying to do something when Japan tried to create a whole new state called Manchuria, and it had similar recognition as Hawaii had. In fact, Hawaii has 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 more recognition technically, as you as you proved today, than than uh, Manchuria, and that was defeated. Uh, that was defeated in the league simply because, um, and this is where colonialism and international law the relationship come out very explicitly. It was because um, the West. Could not have seen a non-European power, non-European American power, trying to be to to, to sort of create new states by recognition, because technically, uh, you know, uh, the Manchurian state had recognition from Burma, Japan, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and there is no international law that says you should have you know, X number of recognitions, or you know, uh, to be a proper state. There is no de there is no definition that puts a number to that. So 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 given uh, that textbooks are very clear about. Uh, you know, there, not, there being no law and state recognition, simply sort of do competing theory, constitutive and declaratory, you make a wonderful, wonderfully clear case um, for your kingdom. I just said, I, it was just a point I wanted to make. Do we have more questions? There's a question from uh, Alexander Posey who says, how is the occupation of Hawaii similar to the occupation of Luxembourg? Okay, well, the similarities between the, the German or Nazi occupation of Luxembourg with the Hawaiian Kingdom is that there was no resistance to the invasion. Now, the lack of resistance does not diminish the status of a country and being a subject of international law. Uh, Nazi, the Nazis or the Germans were still obligated to administer the laws of Luxembourg, but instead embarked on denationalization and tried to treat Luxembourg as if it was an annexed German territory. <laughs> uh, very similar to Hawaii. In fact, Hawaii's situation also is very similar to Kuwait in the first Gulf War, when Saddam Hussein invaded the Kuwait, Kuwaiti territory, yeah. overthrew the Kuwaiti government. Yeah. And that over the Kuwaiti government still going. did not overthrow the Kuwaiti state. Uh, Iraq was also then obligated, like in the case of Luxembourg with Germany, to administer the laws of Kuwait, which it didn't, uh, but that did not diminish the status of Kuwait as a sovereign state. So I think uh, an important distinction has to be made when speaking of international law and international relations is to discern between a government and a state. They're not synonymous. The government exercises the authority of the state and sovereignty is not in the government. Sovereignty is in the state. And that's why all governments are geopolitical. They vary and differ in every state, but yet every state is the same with a defined border yeah, of its territory, centralized government and people in it. And that was, is important because I think many people here, at least here in Hawaii, and, and I also experienced this when I gave a guest lecture at the University of Siena uh, uh, Law School. And when I explained the difference between a state and a government, Professor Federico Lanzarini I uh, had to laugh because he had to explain to the students after, no, no, he's correct. But in domestic law, it's like the state and the government are the same. So when you say the state, you're referring to the government in Italy. But in international relations, the state can continue to exist. 
despite the fact that his government was overthrown. So all of these nuances are so important, as you would know, uh, Professor Singh. And uh, it, it, it's what we teach our students because that brings clarity to situations and that the language that I use in explaining Hawaii's situation is the same language that can explain a situation anywhere in the world because it's international relations and international law. Oh, in fact, I wanted to also point out that Japan, okay, when King Kalakaua of the Hawaiian Kingdom did the world tour, right, in 1881, the Meiji Emperor had a meeting with his foreign minister alone with King Kalakaua. And the Meiji Emperor asked King Kalakaua, there's a transcript on this now, would you be the first power to recognize Japan's full independence so that the others would follow? Now, Kalakaua was not able to recognize formally Japan's independence because uh, we had some domestic problems when he returned home. Yeah. But his successor, Queen Lili Okalani, on January 16, 1893, through the foreign minister, notified Ambassador Irwin, the Hawaiian ambassador in Tokyo, to provide a note to the foreign ministry of Japan that Hawaii has rescinded its consular jurisdiction and recognizes the full independence of Japan. Now, history books tend to show that it was Great Britain that did that in 1894. No, it was the Hawaiian kingdom that did that first in 1893. So all of these things of Hawaii's history is important because it speaks to Hawaii as a country, not as an indigenous tribe, not as a colony. Hawaii was never a colony of any country. In fact, we were a British protectorate, right? A British protectorate since 1794. If we were a British colony, the British would have sent a governor general to Hawaii to run Hawaii in 1794. No, it allowed Kamehameha and Hawaii's chiefs to continue to govern, but they held their allegiance to King George III. That's different. And that was a feudal system, which became a part of the British Empire, that in Hawaii, because it's a Polynesian kingdom, our ali'i system, our chiefly form of governance, bore a remarkable resemblance to the feudal systems of the Middle Ages in Europe. Although the Hawaiian kingdom and Polynesia were running on parallel worlds. They didn't know they even existed because this idea of the feudal system, which is really a creation post Middle Ages, right? America, uh, British lawyers began to coin the term of feudal system, right? But it was that hierarchy, which was really military. And in the Hawaiian kingdom, there are now anthropologists that are now admitting that the Hawaiian kingdom and Tonga of Polynesia were considered back then primary states or archaic states, not linked to the Westphalian states of 1648, but before Mesopotamia, Mesoamerica, so Egypt, right? So there's so many things that are occurring here in our country where the treasure chest has just opened for research. And it's not just about Hawaii continuing to be an independent state, but Hawaii's history is so unique but more so it's, it's Polynesian. And we have a place within our Polynesian family in the Pacific, and that came to be known as Oceania. So I highly recommend people to read and get a copy of uh, Dr. Lawrence Gunster's book, Power in the World, University of Hawaii Press. And it speaks to Hawaii's foreign policy that it had throughout Polynesia. Uh, we were trying to foster more independent states throughout Polynesia to become independent because this was a colonial takeover by the French and the British, Hawaii was able to state that off uh, as an independent state. We have a question. Uh, how can we as Hawaiian kingdom national subjects effectively address the false narratives of indigeneity being fostered by the US and Hawaiian academics? Well, as I asked everyone to do, and, and it was put out, <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Rakbar. Uh, there is an article that I wrote, uh, Setting the Record Straight on Hawaiian Indigeneity. It begins with education because it's not as simple as saying the United States is promoting that narrative. Actually, Hawaiians themselves are promoting that narrative at the University of Hawaii as faculty members. 
right? So we need to realize that this is a very complex situation. It's not necessarily the Occidental versus the Oriental, right? Uh, this is not the West versus the rest. This is about misinformation or what I call disinformation that our, pe that our people are unknowingly promoting themselves. So this is where accountability comes in. And accountability in the academy is a little different than accountability in international humanitarian law, right? So we want to encourage research. And I encourage people at Jindo and other places around the world to continue to do research about this issue to bring awareness, right? So this is not the time to point fingers. You know, you might say the insurgents of 1893 and the administration of the United States under President McKinley, well, they're all dead. They're not here anymore, right? But their legacy is here. And that legacy is what we're dealing with now. And that's where academic research is important and analytical rigor is crucial. So you don't politicize research, you clarify, you explain, because there is where solutions are. Now, for myself in the Council of Regency, I'm also a government official. So I wear a few hats. You know, when I'm at the university as a lecturer, I'm a political scientist, right? But when I engage in, in work as the head of the Royal Commission of Inquiry, I have a mandate. It's investigative authority to investigate war crimes. We want to not come out with reports yet that will specifically name individuals and the evidence of the crimes committed, right? Because we want people to realize how serious this is. And that's why the preliminary reports are crucial to bring awareness, not just of the Council of Regency and its authority, but also the circumstances. Now, once the reports do come out, once they come out, all countries are obligated to prosecute individuals when they receive evidence of war crimes, should they be in transient through their territory or become residents. So this comes under what is called universal jurisdiction and they're supposed to prosecute. Now, it could get political on whether they do or not, but I think what is important to make note of is that Finland and Switzerland are currently prosecuting war criminals out of Liberia who are found in their territory. So before we get to that point of accountability, strict accountability, I want to believe that people will make the right decisions and make course corrections. That's what's important. So with the letters of, with the letter of the National Lawyers Guild, with the International Association of Democratic Lawyers position, it speaks to the international community becoming aware of Hawaii's situation. And I'm very thankful to be invited for this webinar, Professor Singh, and the Center for International Legal Studies to help get this word out and encourage people to do their critical research. And I would like to say, you can count me in in giving a guest lecture in your classes, no problem. <laughs> I'll be very honored to have you again in our classes and not just in my classes, we are a large school and we teach international law and your number of teachers uh, teaching international in number of classes. So hopefully this is just the start of this wonderful conversation. As I said, I really admired how you, you made a case uh, for a, a, the independence of your state right within the doctrine of international law. I really, really admire that. Thank you. So if you do not have Thank any you. more questions, we'd like to uh, uh, end this wonderful talk. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. So thank you, Dr. Sai, for this presentation and I hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs>